By the end of 1944, the people of Germany were dying, their cities on fire, their armed forces surrounded, outnumbered, retreating on every front. Still, the conquering allies were afraid of Germany despite their own overwhelming military strength. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was afraid that the German spirit would rise again and they would attack the British Empire. American President Franklin Roosevelt was afraid that German industrialists would rise again and conquer world markets. Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin was afraid that German fascism would rise again and destroy communism. As Allied tanks were racing into Germany in September 1944, Churchill and Roosevelt met in Quebec City to decide what to do after the war was over. They discussed a plan to pastoralize Germany, which meant in reality to keep on killing Germans for years after they had surrendered. Pastoralize was a new word in good speak, the language which controls people by deceiving them. Pastoralization meant that even after Germany surrendered, there would be no peace. Instead, the war would continue by other means. Like the war itself, the post-war treatment was carefully planned. First, Allied planes swept over the battlefields, dropping a powerful drug called hope onto the German soldiers. The drug was contained in millions of leaflets promising peace, food, and shelter if the soldiers surrendered. The next phase of the plan was devised by Roosevelt's friend Henry C. Morgenthau, who was Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. In their meeting at Quebec, President Roosevelt approved the Morgenthau plan to pastoralize Germany, but Winston Churchill said it was unnatural, unchristian, and unnecessary. Then Morgenthau persuaded Roosevelt to offer Churchill an enormous bribe of six billion dollars to approve the plan. Churchill and Roosevelt secretly approved it in September 1944. Within a few weeks, the press discovered that the Morgenthau plan would starve Germans to death after the war. This enraged the people of North America and Britain, who wanted peace, not vengeance. In the United States, Thomas Dewey, a senior Republican, said, this is like adding 10 fresh divisions to the German army. German propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels ordered every civilian to turn his house into a fortress. Roosevelt hastily covered up the Morgenthau plan under another good speak term, Joint Chiefs of Staff Order 1067 or simply JCS 1067. Under this title, the Morgenthau plan to pastoralize Germany was being implemented even before the German surrender in May 1945. The Allies said in a press conference in March 1945 that their many millions of German prisoners would be protected by the International Red Cross under the Geneva Convention. Now, no more killing, no more casualties. But the Americans prevented the Red Cross from visiting the starving prisoners. Trying to give this treatment legal justification in March 1945, General Eisenhower, Allied commander in Western Europe, asked his commander in Washington, General George Marshall, to invent a new category called Disarmed Enemy Forces, DEF. This was more good speak, meaning that many German soldiers lost their precious right to visits from the Red Cross camp inspectors under the Geneva Convention. When that right was abolished, Eisenhower could hide the deadly conditions in the U.S. Army prison camps. The prisoners were routinely deprived of shelter, medical aid, and food. Some did not even receive water for days. Once they were designated disarmed enemy forces, DEF, instead of prisoners of war, they were entitled to nothing. 
Joachim Buf, as a young lieutenant, was a prisoner first in Budrich, then in Rheinberg. Also die Verwundeten, die da waren, so wie ich es erlebt habe, wurden nicht versorgt. Well, from my own experience, I saw that the wounded were left unattended. No one cared. We were treated just like cattle. There was no camp, just the Rhine Meadows, which later turned into a swampy morass. There were no tents or shelter of any kind, and they had robbed us of everything. We were all freezing, shivering with cold. We were standing, lying, squatting, and so we huddled together like football players. We tried to find a dry spot and lay there, in the open, of course. Das war so, das haben ältere Leute alle nicht überstanden. That was how it was. There were older people who did not survive all this. We got almost nothing to eat, let alone a hot meal. For the first approximately 100,000 people, there was a single source of Rheinwater. It was a pipe as thick as one's arm through which Rheinwater was pumped, running continuously. And there, if you were lucky, by jostling in the muck, you could just fill a little tin can with Rheinwater. The result was an outbreak of diseases, typhoid fever, which I contracted as well. The main preparation the Americans made for most prisoners was to erect barbed wire fences around swampy meadows along the Rhine River. Everyone in Germany wearing a uniform, including streetcar drivers, foresters, wounded men in hospitals, and their nurses, was taken to the barbed wire prison gates, stripped of identity markers, robbed of their valuables, and abandoned in the mud. Die Plünderungen sind nachher im sogenannten Lager tagtäglich. Das gehörte zum Tagesablauf. Das, uh Later, lootings happened every day in the so-called camp. During the daily roll call, U.S. soldiers, one with a machine gun and another robbing the people. Everything had to be shown. Wedding rings, medals, military, decorations of honor if you had them. They had them all over their bodies, the rich watches all the way up their arms. Die Uhren hatten sie bis oben an den Armen. Also alles und alles, was sie nicht interessierten, schmissen sie in den Dreck. They took everything, and what did not interest them, they threw in the mud. They said, that ring can't be pulled off. And so they drew a knife and simply chopped off the finger. Hidden from the Red Cross and journalists, the Americans began to keep false records of the prisoner totals, including transfers, additions, and so on. But there was a strange category marked other losses. The meaning of this term was explained in 1988 by Colonel Philip S. Lauben, chief of the German Affairs Branch of Army Headquarters. Other losses meant deaths and escapes. And the escapes were very, very minor, fewer than one-tenth of one percent, Colonel Lauben said. Washington ordered Eisenhower to keep the situation in the camps secret. The message to him read, Germans are responsible for feeding and maintaining disarmed enemy troops. There should be no public declaration regarding status German armed forces or disarmed troops. But the prisoners themselves were well aware of their status as they stood in the open fields in the mud. Als wir also aus den Wagen runtergetrieben wurden, wurden wir auf diese Wiesen in ein... So, when we were shoved off the boxcars, we were driven into the meadows in a big pack. And at the very beginning, we were told over the loudspeaker, you are not regular prisoners of war, you are disarmed enemies, and therefore do not fall under the Geneva Convention. Entwaffnete Feinde und fallt deswegen nicht unter die Genfer Vereinbarung. And we were also told, to make things perfectly clear, on Eisenhower's order, in English and in German, that they had not come to free us from National Socialism, but to eliminate Germany once and for all. Uns vom Nationalsozialismus zu befreien, sondern wir sind gekommen, um Deutschland endgültig auszuschalten. At first, Eisenhower had been told to feed his prisoners, 
from small captured German stocks, not from the abundant American supplies. But a few weeks afterwards, on May 8th, Eisenhower, as military governor of Western Germany, sent out this contradictory message to all German citizens through their local governments. Under no circumstances may food supplies be assembled among the inhabitants in order to bring them to the German prisoners of war. Those who violate this command and nevertheless try to circumvent this blockade place themselves in danger of being shot. Not knowing this order, 16-year-old Irene Baltz learned of the terrible need in the camp near her home in Heilbronn and took her aunt's basket full of food collected from local farmers to the camp. So we said, oh, that will be wonderful. Now those guys have at least something to eat and they can share it with others. So we went up there and we seen a so, uh, American soldier which guarded, you know, there are many of them, but he was there where we came and we asked him if he would give that to the prisoners and he said, oh sure. So he went and then he opened the door and we followed them and we seen how he walked in and he put it on, a, on one of those holes very close by and so all of a sudden you seen two, three, four guys crawling out and so soon they got close to the basket he took a canister of gas, thrown it in, put a uh, match into it and whoosh, everything went up in flames and naturally my girlfriend and I, we stood there and cried like two little kids. Eisenhower's new orders were so strictly enforced that one U.S. Army guard named Martin Breck was told that he would be shot if he gave bread to the prisoners. I was a guard at a U.S. Army prison camp and I was warned not to speak about what I experienced or I'd be in trouble. Uh, why do you think uh, people warned you not to speak out? Well, the conditions in the, in the camp were abominable. We uh, neglected to feed them properly. They got a can of watery soup once a day, and it was, it was so inadequate they were throwing grass and weeds into it when they could find them. They were starving. And we did not have enough water for them even. We were near the Rhine River, so they would crawl under the wires in an effort to get some water and we'd machine gun them when they did that. Machine gun them? Yes. And uh, they, they had no blankets, no tents, some of them had no overcoats, and they were sleeping in the mud. This was April towards the end of the war, and uh, it was a cold uh, late spring, and so it was, they were dying, and dying in great numbers. And what impressed us, all of us, of course, were the trucks hauling the bodies away. We were told when we were on guard duty to shoot any civilians that approached the wires for any reason. And these prisoners uh, had surrendered in expectation that they would be treated according to the Geneva Convention, is that correct? That's correct. They made great efforts to surrender to us rather than and the Russians uh, thinking we would treat them decently. And they were captured in uniform. They were not uh, committing any war crimes or ever accused of war crimes, is that no, we had prisoners there from age, it uh, looked like uh, 12 or younger perhaps, and uh, or o over 70, or, you know, old men and very young children in, in, in the camp. And this camp consisted just of a field and barbed wire and dying prisoners, was that's, it? That's right, yes, yes. How did you feel about this? Well, I was 18 and this was a very uh, outrageous experience to me. I was, I was uh, shocked. And uh, some of the other prison guards were shocked too. Some of them were very blasé about this. Did you uh, all go together and make a protest or anything like that? No, I made individual protests to, to my immediate superiors. And I, a friend of mine was on KP, kitchen duty, and uh, he would give me K rations. So I would throw them over the wires. And. Uh, I've kept silent so long, I, I, you know, it's been repressed so long. And so, um, I'd be threatened. 
uh, with court martial. And finally, when I kept doing this, one officer in, in exasperation threatened to shoot me. But of course, this probably was hyperbole. But uh, these, uh, he, he it seemed to be a very uh, strict order that they were following. That ex one of them bothered to explain to me that they were following orders too, and this is the way it should be. And I dare not oppose them. Perhaps it was not hyperbole. The French, who took over many hundreds of thousands of prisoners from the Americans in July 1945 to use as slave labor in France, also had such orders. This order contravened the Geneva Convention and Eisenhower's own personal promises to the German soldiers. Several women were shot and killed by guards at the Rhine camps, including Frau Anja Spira, who brought food to the prisoners in the French camps at Dietersheim. At the camp in Bretzenheim nearby, the rations were about 800 calories per day, as this army ration book shows. However, starvation was unnecessary except as vengeance. Across the Nahe River in Bad Kreuznach, Walter Eberhardt, a teenage civilian, arrested from his home, was in another huge camp. Ich habe zwei Tage nichts bekommen. Am dritten Tag drei rohe Kartoffeln. Kurz danach brach die Ruhe aus in dem Camp aufgrund dieser Ernährung. For two days I did not get anything to drink or to eat. On the third day, three raw potatoes. Shortly afterwards, dysentery broke out in the camp on account of this diet. Later in the youth camp, I experienced somewhat better conditions. There they introduced bread. One loaf for a hundred people. The loaf was given to the officer in charge of a hundred soldiers. He in turn had ten officers under him, each responsible for ten soldiers. Under their supervision the bread was cut into ten parts, and the officer in charge of ten soldiers went to his group and again divided this tenth of the loaf. This is how they introduced bread. Dann wieder in zehn Teile. So wurde das Brot eingeführt. Joachim Buff describes the extensive food supplies in his camp at Rheinberg. The food supply situation was like this. From the enormous mountains of food cartons stacked as high as a house, partly from German stocks, it appeared as though the food situation was excellent. Several times I saw that those handing out the food were sitting high up there on the boxes. And when the German officers came one after the other, each of them for his group of a hundred or ten soldiers respectively, they were told, you're not going to get anything today. You were the major criminals. And then we returned to the starving and said, we got nothing. Britain and Canada had two million German prisoners who suffered far less than most others, although camps over Rishi and Aurich were hellholes of neglect and disease. Some German prisoners were seriously maltreated in the interrogation center in Bad Nendorf. Most prisoners were discharged in time to help with the harvest of 1945. The deadly conditions in the American camps were not confined to those along the Rhine, but prevailed among all 200 American camps in Germany. Major General Richard Steinbach, then a colonel in the United States 7th Army, took over a camp at Heilbronn, built for 200,000 prisoners. I was deputy to General Van Leer, who was deputy theater commander to, to Eisenhower. In 1945, it became obvious that the POW camp at Heilbronn, which was in our area, was very badly managed, and that they weren't being treated properly. It was crowded. Uh, more people than they should have had. We saw 
the, the men that dug holes in the ground. Were some of the men sleeping without any shelter at all, in holes in the ground? Yeah. They were. A lot of them, most of them. Most of them. They got about 1,100 calories a day. And is that enough to support life? No, it takes 1,700 calories to support life. What did you uh, think when you saw these conditions? I thought they had to be corrected. I ordered the U.S. camp commander to get supplementary ration. Have you ever heard of the Morgenthau Plan? Yes. Uh, do you know what the plan uh, meant? It meant starvation for the German POW and the, the German population. Uh, when did that plan uh, start operating, do you know? Immediately after the war. A little while later, Steinbach was sent to the U.S. on medical leave, and the shortages began again. Dragging the corpses out of Heilbronn was such a big job that the army set up a sham hospital near the camp entrance where moribund prisoners would go to die. The guards wouldn't have to drag their corpses so far to the trucks. The chief medical officer in the sham hospital at Heilbronn was a private, Daniel McConnell, who had no medical training, no doctors, and no drugs beyond aspirin. After the war, the U.S. government awarded him 100% medical disability for post-traumatic stress disorder, largely because of his experience at Heilbronn. The Americans were not the only ones punishing Germans. More than three quarters of a million prisoners were delivered half dead to the French army to use as slave labor in France. The Americans transferred them in crowded closed boxcars along with coffins and boxes of quicklime to disinfect their corpses. The French sent thousands of prisoners into minefields with no training and inadequate equipment to dig up mines. Many of them were blown up. The French camp smelled so badly of decaying bodies and latrines that journalists noticed. Le Monde of Paris published in the autumn of 1945 a report by a bright young writer named Jacques Fauvet. As one speaks today of Dachau, in 10 years, people throughout the world will speak about camps like saint paul de jaux where 17,000 prisoners were dying so fast that within two weeks, two cemeteries of 200 graves each had been filled. This is a death rate of over 65% per year. In Europe at the time, the death rate among civilians was under 2% per year. In other words, for every normal death in Europe, 30 surrendered Germans died at saint paul des jaux Fauvet goes on. People will object that the Germans weren't very particular on the matter of feeding our men. But even if they did violate the Geneva Convention, that hardly seems to justify that we follow their example. Representative Jean-Pierre Pradervant of the International Committee of the Red Cross visited the French camp at torre les pins in late September 1945, took photographs of the starving prisoners there, and wrote a report in which he said that the 200,000 prisoners in their present condition would not survive the coming winter. The commander-in-chief of the French camps, Major General Louis Buisson, wrote, They were given enough food so that they did not die too, too quickly. Wolfgang Heinrich, 17 years old, was shipped from Rheinberg to a camp in France. In Le Mans schossen manchmal die Bewachungssoldaten, das waren Franzosen, die schossen einfach mal so aus Spaß ins Lager, nachts. Und, uh, in Le Mans, the guards, they were French, sometimes fired shots at random into the camp at night, just for fun. And well, it seems that 
most of the food was moved away, for food was so scarce in Le Mans that we became really weak. If you wanted to stand up, you had to hold on to a tent pole, so undernourished we were, even as young guys. Washing was impossible, and there were no toilets either. Instead, there was only a plank in front of a hole, and if a man was too weak to sit on it and fell over backwards, he was gone. The French camps became known as les camps de la mort d'Alte, or slow death camps. In the summer of 1945, the Morgenthau Plan was incorporated into the Potsdam Agreement among the victorious Allies and was signed by Truman, Churchill and Stalin. It turned vengeance into official policy, sanctioning the hatred which European civilians already felt. More than 16 million people in East Prussia, Silesia, Pomerania and smaller areas were expelled by force from their land and their houses. They had to leave most of their possessions behind. The little they could take with them was piled high on wagons, handcarts, and even baby carriages. As the farmers trudged along the highways, their cattle followed in the fields beside them. The Soviet writer Ilya Ehrenberg wrote articles for his army newspaper, Red Flag, urging Soviet soldiers to rape as many women as they could. Millions of women were raped. The poet Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote in shame about a rape in Prussia when he was a Soviet officer in 1945. In his book of poems, Prussian Nights, he wrote, 22 Horingstrasse. It's not been burned, just looted, rifled, a moaning by the walls half muffled, the mothers wounded, still alive, the little daughters on the mattress, dead. How many have been on it? A platoon, a company perhaps? The mother begs, kill me, soldier. This poem by a winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature went unpublished for 30 years. Until recently, it was only by word of mouth that a few people in Germany and Russia could express what had happened. Some could not bring themselves to tell their stories at all. Anna Tewer was sent as slave labor to the Ukraine. I haven't talked about it for years. I didn't want to upset my children. I thought they should grow up without, without any hate. I was a 17-year-old girl when I was deported to a slave camp in the Ukraine in Krivoy Rok for two and a half years. When I came back, after two and a half years, I weighed 30 kilograms. I had lost my homeland. I had lost most of my relatives, and I was all by myself in East Germany. I never knew what happened to my mother or my grandparents, and I just wanted to get home, but we never got home. It was not until 1990 that Johannes Heising, first a prisoner of the Americans and then of the French, who later became the abbot of a monastery on the Rhine, published a book about his experiences in the American camp at Remagen. Later on, another former prisoner at Remagen wrote to him asking why he hadn't described the American bulldozer that buried living men in their earth holes while other prisoners screamed, murderer, murderer. Heising said, we tried not to see the suffering in extenso and dying comrades. The horrors of the camp and occupation themselves imposed a form of censorship because the human mind protects itself from cruel memories by refusing to store the worst images. Even in the German Bundestag a quarter of a century later, 
self-censorship cancelled reality. The foreign minister, Willy Brandt, told the Bundestag in 1969 that the foreign office had to go into the book publishing business so that he could instruct a group of German authors in how to write about the million and a half soldiers still missing after 24 years. He told the whole nation that this was to prevent the authors from provoking a public discussion at home and abroad, which would open old wounds and would not serve the reconciliation efforts of the Federal Republic's foreign policy. At the highest levels of the German government, it was therefore official policy to say that only the Germans were guilty for the war. Only German atrocities would be counted. Education and the media were severely controlled so that the new generation grew up believing that their ancestors were uniquely criminal on a global scale. This good speak policy towards history is still enforced today. In Germany, what is known is not true, and what is true is not known. But Konrad Adenauer, who in 1945 was the mayor of Cologne, had not learned good speak. In 1945, Adenauer told an American army officer to his face that thousands of prisoners had died because they were held in American camps in conditions contrary to the Geneva Convention. He quoted ordinary Germans as saying that the Americans were not much better than the Nazis. But the Allies, through their German servants, censored such comments out of the German media. So Chancellor Adenauer had to travel beyond Allied control to the Swiss Parliament in Bern in March of 1949, where he could speak openly about the German expellees, Adenauer said, and these are his handwritten notes, later reprinted in his memoirs, six million German refugees have vanished from the earth. They are dead, gone. This was even more shocking because the six million refugee deaths were in addition to the million and a half prisoner deaths. Germans and allies suspected Adenauer was telling the truth, but the allies angrily denied it in their newspapers. A few concerned people in the allies' homelands spoke out with Adenauer. In 1946, the British writer and publisher Victor Gollanx made a widely publicized visit to the British zone where he observed children starving in the rubble, which had been Dusseldorf and Hamburg. In his books, Gollanx severely criticized the Allies and demanded food and shelter for the starving and homeless. The Canadian writer and broadcaster Robert Greer Allen reads from his report from Berlin in 1945 where he saw refugees in the Stettiner Station. People sitting on bundles of clothes, crouched by handcarts and little wagons. But they were all exhausted, starved, and miserable. You'd see a child sitting on a roll of blankets, a girl of perhaps four or five, and her eyes would be only half open, and her head will loll occasionally, and her eyes blink slowly, as though she were only half alive. In the United States Senate, American Senators William Langer and Kenneth Huary protested vigorously against the situation in Germany, but they were ignored by the principal American media. So they went to see President Truman to persuade him to appoint Herbert Hoover to lead a famine relief campaign. Hoover had led a very successful food campaign after World War I, so he was able to start immediately a campaign for worldwide food relief. In 1945-46, Germany was excluded from all relief under the Morgenthau Plan embedded in JCS 1067, but Hoover and the Canadians soon extended the aid to the former enemy. The Canadian government under Prime Minister Mackenzie King 
committed so much food to the worldwide program that the government had to keep rationing Canadians' food until 1948. Canadian cabinet official Mitchell Sharp said, when asked why the government did this, why, it's what we do. In other words, he was saying, this is what people do. They always help each other unless they're prevented by force majeure, such as war. This enormous relief campaign was carried out by the American and Canadian people with some help from Argentina and Australia. Hoover Speisung, or Hoover Food, served to children in schools, is remembered by many Germans still alive today. One child sent thanks to Herbert Hoover with this map showing the route the food took by train and ship over the Atlantic to a school in Hamburg. But afraid of public opinion at home, the Allies had to hide what they were doing in Germany, so they also had to hide that the Allies themselves were causing the suffering. Therefore, the tremendous efforts of the food campaign went mainly unrecorded for 50 years, while writers and filmmakers in the West published thousands of films and books on their favorite theme, Germans as savage killers rampaging throughout the world, and they are still saying that. After Konrad Adenauer became the Chancellor of West Germany in 1949, he decided to investigate the rumors of mass deaths among the missing prisoners. He appointed the Ausschuss für Kriegsgefangenenfragen, or Commission into the Prisoners of War question, which in 1953 produced the names of over 1,154,000 German prisoners still missing or not accounted for after nine years of so-called peace or pastoralization. The Adenauer government deposited this list of missing POWs in the United Nations in New York asking for action. Nothing was done, although scores of monuments to German crimes have been erected in Poland, Germany, France, England, Canada, and the United States. Because of Cold War hostility, Adenauer's prisoner survey was incomplete in East Germany, and later surveys, including East Germany, showed that the true figure of the missing prisoners of war was between one and a half and two million dead in camps of the USSR, the USA, and France. Among the civilians in all of Germany, disease and starvation drove the death rate higher than it had been since the Middle Ages. In Berlin in the summer of 1945, the death rate among babies and infants was almost 100%. The few tiny survivors faced a death rate 10 times the rate in the rest of Europe. Eva Berk was the young mother of a baby herself in a small town in Thuringia in 1945. I had ration card number two, and I was hungry all the time. It hurts in your stomach. It aches like, like you have a bad toothache in your stomach. Um, all the time. Where would the soldier would have met them? Um, an older man who had ration card number five, which you could almost figure out on paper when he was going to be dead of starvation. For years, the Allies imposed severe trade restrictions on the Germans to impede their recovery. Communication between the occupied zones was banned or reduced, making it impossible for normal business to revive. The Allies lifted all machines from many factories and carried them away. The press was discouraged from reporting these events. According to Herbert Hoover, he could believe only one-tenth of what he was told by the Morgenthau people, who reported in good speak even to him. Homegrown German food was stolen, along with wood, coal, and almost a third of Germany's best farmland. Over $20 billion in reparations were exacted. That was the amount that the Allies admitted that they had taken, but the true amount was much greater. The American historian John Gimbel 
found that the Allies were hiding thefts between 4.8 billion and 12 billion dollars in intellectual property alone, plus billions more in confiscated foreign assets, shipping, machinery, food, coal, and timber. The men having been killed, imprisoned, maimed, or enslaved, the women took over. These Trümmerfrauen, or rubble women, knocked mortar by hand from every single brick to rebuild the demolished cities, brick by brick. Starving mothers among them cared for their hungry children in basement ruins, meagerly supported by the food relief from North America. The situation in Germany was bizarre. The Allies were wrecking factories but demanding reparations from German industry, starving the people but forcing them to work, wreaking deadly vengeance but feeding them from sympathy. The more that the Holy Alliance covered up their crimes with good speak, the more they relied on good speak. The more they relied on it, the more they believed it themselves until they literally did not know what they were saying. At a high level meeting with the Russians in 1947, during the worst German starvation, US Secretary of State George Marshall was so misinformed that he told the Soviets at the table that the Americans had taken only $10 million in reparations, whereas economist historian John Gimbel said that they had taken more than $5 billion worth, which is 5,000 times as much. The Soviets and the Americans each accused the other of lying about their reparations as the Germans starved to death in the streets outside the door. Unable to speak to each other honestly, the former allies mistrusted each other so much that the Western allies began strengthening Germans in the three Western zones so they could become allies against the Soviets in the East. The Western allies reduced reparations, reformed the inflated currency, permitted immigration, and restored communications, although they did not restore free speech. The West Germans began the Wirtschaftswunder, or economic miracle. Starting with starvation and rubble and virtually no natural resources, the West Germans within 15 years had achieved the economic primacy in Europe that the Allies had fought for two world wars to prevent. Soon the Germans were once again among the richest people in the world. They thus proved that for the Allies to resist German economic superiority, war was pointless. And for the Germans to gain superiority, war was not necessary. People everywhere admired the Germans for their amazing achievements. No one asked why they so recently had been starving and destitute. If the historians of the Holy Alliance wrote anything at all about Germany immediately after 1945, they blithely passed over millions of German deaths to praise the Nuremberg trials of Nazi leaders. Good speak, plus shame for their own death camps and distaste for the ugly subject itself, annihilated research about the occupation. Apart from a few small circulation books about the expulsions, nothing accurate was published about the Morgenthau Plan and German starvation for many years after the war. The starvation was caused, Western historians said, because there had been a world food shortage, but the United Nations officially disproved this. Food production around the world was higher in 1947 than ever before. Many Germans starved and only because the Allies denied them food. Millions more Germans died of Allied action after the war than during the war. But nothing was accurately recorded until 1989. During the war, the German government counted about 4.5 million dead soldiers and civilians. The German censuses observed by U.S. Ambassador Robert Murphy have shown 
that the deaths in Germany increased greatly after the war, reaching certainly 9 million more dead Germans and perhaps up to 14 million in the six years of peace, only because of Allied policy. We can never be sure of the total number because the Allied governments covered up this tremendous national slaughter and are still doing so. As the U.S. Naval officer, Dr. Albert Benke said, Germany was subjected to physical and psychic trauma unparalleled in history. Then in 1989, from far away Canada came a book entitled Other Losses, revealing that over a million German prisoners had died in French and American camps, 10 times as many as fell in the fighting in the whole west of Europe in 1940 to 1945. The foreword to other losses was written by a senior United States Army historian, Colonel Ernest F. Fisher. This eminent American authority stated that the French and American armies had casually annihilated about one million men, end quote. Other losses, the book caused a scandal among politicians, diplomats, journalists, and academics in Western Europe and North America. At first, the senior American writer on Eisenhower, Stephen E. e. Ambrose, supported the findings in other losses. After reading the book in manuscript, he wrote, I have now read other losses and I wish I had not. I have had nightmares every night since I started reading. You have a sensational, if appalling, story and it can no longer be suppressed. The full impact of which neither you nor I nor anyone can fully imagine. Many will curse you, many will denounce you, many will argue with you, most will try to ignore you. Sincerely, Stephen E. Ambrose. After the book came out, Ambrose appeared on the Dan Rather CBS News. I think Jim Bach has made a major historical find here. It has, it is, it is, to me as an American historian, I'm ashamed. Uh, there was sadism, brutality, there was denial of, me denial of medical supplies that were available, denial of water in some cases. When they were right on the banks of the Rhine, men died of dehydration. Now throughout the Allied countries, remarkable scenes occurred. Many thousands of eyewitnesses who had been prisoners, including guards and one camp commander, said on film, television, and in newspapers that the American camps were deadly and that other losses was true. A Canadian magazine made the book a cover story. German newspapers were flooded with letters to the editor after the book was reviewed. A few Allied historians immediately protested. No, there were no such mass deaths. The contrast could scarcely have been more striking. All those who said the camps were deadly had been in them. None of the historians who said the camps were okay had been in one. It was an historical insurrection. The voiceless and powerless victims, who had long been silenced by the powerful few, suddenly rose as witnesses against them. Then, in February of 1990, Stephen Ambrose, contradicting what he had previously stated, wrote a review in the New York Times book review saying that other losses was spectacularly flawed and would be seen to be worse than worthless when the necessary research was done." End quote. Sir Michael Howard in the Times Literary Supplement in England admitted that he was an enumerate historian, incompetent to judge the book's crucial statistics, but he nevertheless knew that they were wrong because they could not meet his standard of inherent probability. Sir Michael did not define his standard of inherent probability, which was just as well, because standards are fixed and probability varies, so the two are incompatible. This helped to impose only one view of history, namely that harsh view of Germany imposed by the Holy Alliance in 1919, 
reinforced in 1945 and still in place today. The view is that Germany alone bears the guilt for starting both wars, that her Nazi leaders were all criminals fairly tried and justly punished at Nuremberg. Even today, this is enforced by special provisions in German criminal law against denying or belittling Nazi crimes. Many Germans accept this without inquiry because they consider it to be politically correct. As it was before, so it is again. The people of Germany are misinformed by inaccurate films and books to their own economic and spiritual disadvantage. As it has been said by Bundeswehr officer Max Klar, quote, Germany is a nation of wounded souls, quote. And when one generation writes history down wrong, the next may want to fix it with a bomb. Lying and spying go on everywhere, but they also have a local habitation, and the name is Military Industrial Complex, which now controls the Holy Alliance of Britain, France, Canada, and the USA, victors of both wars against Germany. President Eisenhower explained the term in his exit speech in January 1961. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. The military-industrial leaders have taken over the minds of hundreds of millions of people around the world, word by word, mind by mind, tax by tax, war by war, debt by debt, through the Cold War and all the other post-war wars of the Holy Alliance. The complex has become seamless with us, has identified with us, militarized us, bit by bit, by byte, by megabyte. This process has been thorough and extensive, beginning in government archives, which in the 1940s were censored by Eisenhower to hide his crimes against German prisoners and going on through modern times. In 1987, Major Merritt Drucker of the U.S. Army was stationed in Germany with the U.S. Army near Rheinberg. He then discovered from a German ex-prisoner that there had been a huge POW camp near Rheinberg. We were never told anything about this phase of U.S. history. Most of um, the education that we had about the Second World War or the fate of the German people uh, just kind of skipped over this. I'll be very honest with you, it's a disgraceful period in our, unfortunately, our Army history and our U.S. government history. But in the Rhine Meadow camps, it's almost an unrelieved story of uh, human misery and suffering. Unfortunately, as I understand it, the situation in Germany is such that any effort to open them up the subject of the Rhine Meadow camps to conduct ceremonies or to locate the graves is uh, considered almost far right wing. It's extremely difficult for German political leaders, elected or appointed officials, to delve into this subject without being immediately accused of being neo-Nazi or sympathizing to the far right. The subject is a, is a forbidden subject. Uh, for the most part in Germany and in the United States it's a subject we don't want to write about and don't want to investigate so for these reasons the uh, the subject uh, has has been covered up uh, to an extent just denial of it not looking at it not researching destroying records is one way that history can be can be covered up we need to do history better we need to do military history <laughs> in an accurate, objective fashion. The accuracy and honesty of such brave men as Colonel Fisher, Alfred Desaius, Edward Snowden, or Julian Assange 
are obvious, but we scarcely notice because we rarely feel the insidious slow takeover of our minds word by word. The military industrial leaders contort words by the ignorant force of their misconceptions, such as a mission means an attack, oversight uniquely means overview, degrade means obliterate, other losses means massacre, mission accomplished stands for mission failed, neutralize means murder, enhanced interrogation hides torture, asset means fighter jet, Cattle means terrify, pacify says crush, surveil means spy, stabilize means subjugate, pastoralize means genocide, and democracy means tyranny. These changes were conceived by the military industrial leaders and later spread by infected journalists. Every time you use or understand one of these words, a few synapses of your memory are infected. Every time you hear the word torture and you ease your conscience by translating it to mean enhanced interrogation, you are spreading the infection in your brain. The infected synapses spread the virus until your earlier version of yourself has mutated into a newer version of yourself and you have become what you did not want to be. You are one of them. This gradual seizure of power over us is not a hostile takeover, but a merger between the power elite and the flattered masses who loved to believe what they were told at the end of each of our post-war wars. We were victorious because we were virtuous, which has now become we are virtuous because we were victorious. To maintain the virtue of the Holy Alliance, ratified at Nuremberg, we continue to maintain the criminality of Germany. That is why, astoundingly, there is no peace treaty for World War II between the Holy Alliance and Germany. That is why the Holy Alliance blames the Germans for starting the war and for their evil deeds in their concentration camps. That is why there are still 100 American military bases in Germany. That is why Germany has paid hundreds of billions of dollars to its victims. Why it places armaments at the service of the Allies and Israel. Why the UN Charter to this day identifies Germany as a hostile state. And that is probably why the bankrupt United States government is so reluctant to return the 300 tons of German gold deposited there for safety during the Cold War. Germany, the obedient servant of the Holy Alliance, has nevertheless become one of the most popular, progressive, and prosperous nations of the world. The United States, secure, prosperous, and popular around the world in 1945, is now, to many people, a frightening and discredited warmonger. The Allies forced lessons on the Germans by murder and by defeat. Learn some humility. Correct your faults. Apologize for your crimes. Compensate your victims. And reduce militarism. We might help the Germans of today to realize that they are still enchanted by stories of their guilt. It would be healthy for those of us in the Holy Alliance to seek forgiveness from the Germans for what we have done. The Germans have learned lessons from their atrocities. We have learned nothing from ours. Perhaps we will soon. One day we must. <laughs>